Welcome to another edition of Journey of Hope. Stories of people that have been impacted by the healing ministry of Loma Linda University Medical Center. We're here in the studio at LLBN and just down the road is uh, one of the hospitals. One, we have five hospitals here at Loma Linda. And we are having about 750,000 outpatient visits a year. 30,000, 30,000 plus inpatient visits. People of all different backgrounds and people from around the world come here. And our special guest today is a, a very unusual individual, outstanding athlete, former Olympian, had renal failure, had some heart problems, had cancer, but he was an exceptional athlete that enabled him to go through many of these uh, experiences. Our special guest is Ronaldo Brown. Ronaldo, we're glad to have you here. It's and a pleasure. We're to be going here. to learn about the tremendous journey that you've been on. But I know as I've uh, gotten acquainted with you, you were in not just one Olympics, but you were in two in 1968. And that was in Mexico City. City yes. And in 1972. Yeah, at Munich, Germany. I was an alternate at Munich, Germany. You were an alternate yeah. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, as I read the records uh, and there are some of the reports here, mm -hmm. it appears as though you set a record in high school for high jumping. Yes. And tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I was the uh, first high schooler to jump seven feet in uh, high school. So, you know, um, you know, it was a, I had great coaches and I, you know, I, it was something that I wanted to do. I grew up in the city of Compton. And, you know, uh, growing up as a kid, I wanted to do, I, you know, I kept seeing you know, the guys before me, Willie Mays, Wilk Chamberlain, and those guys, they motivated me to do things. Some great role models. Well, great role models, yeah. And I kind of figured, well, you know, they talked about them coming up and, you know, living in a poor area or whatever, and, you know, athletics took them to the next level. And I thought it would be a great thing for me to get in some kind of athletics because I was tall and I didn't want to just waste my height, you know, and, uh, and it worked for me. So you're six foot six. Yes. And were you six six in high school? Uh, I was six six in high school. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now, what other sports were you involved in? Uh, basketball, also. I played basketball, you know, from junior high school to high school. In fact, as we were visiting, I learned that you were in the in the next sixty eight sixty nine, you had a, some kind of a record there. What was it? Yeah, we are our team, our sixty eight team and our sixty nine team, we won uh sixty two straight games. Sixty two straight games. Yes, and we still hold that record today. And to today after I leave this interview, we're going out I'm going out to Compton because they're gonna be honoring us for a uh, you know, for that achievement. Well that is so we're yeah. talking about forty years ago. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yes. Forty years ago. Yeah. Well, so you grew up in a home and athletics was became very important to you and you saw it as a way of kind of breaking out and you had some other role models that you were looking at. So at the young age of seventeen, I think you were the youngest to participate in the Olympics that year, is that correct? Yeah, for the uh, men's uh, track and field team, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, I understand you did quite well. Is that the when you came in fifth? I finished fifth, yes. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. so things were going well for you. You went on to uh, college, I think it was at Cal Poly? Yes, Cal Poly up in San Luis Obispo. And why did you choose to go to Cal Poly? Well, because I had... Uh, you know, traveled the world. Uh, uh, well, I figured I was going to be traveling a lot, and I figured where I, I just wanted to go somewhere that wasn't too far, and I was going to live in California after college anyway. So I wanted to, you know, stay in California, and I didn't want to go too far. So I went up to Cal Poly. I had a friend uh, who named Lowell Henry who, you know, talked about Cal Poly, and we went up to visit, and I just fell in love with it. And I said, okay, this is for me. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful campus. Beautiful campus yeah. And you uh, majored in what? Uh, communications at that time. And mm -hmm. you graduated there with a degree there in, yeah. in communications and information systems and so forth. Yeah. So after you graduated, were you still taking part in sports? Yes, because at that time, uh, my high jumping, I guess I was really at my you know, peak or whatever. Really excelling. You know, excelling, yeah. And I continued to jump. I you know, won the NCAA you know, for Cal Poly, I guess uh, four times or something like that. And, you know, set numerous records and, you know, but the thing that really, that I liked about it was the travel. 
I got to travel. I got to see things in the world that I knew that I wouldn't be able to pay for, you know, after sure. college or even if I was working, you know. And there's an education in traveling, and I got, going I got to all a lot of people. Oh, man, it was an education. It, yeah. was really, it was really great. I really enjoyed it. So after you graduated, where was where did you end up going to work? I went, I went to work at uh, Hughes Aircraft. Uh, in El Segundo at that time, and I stayed with Hughes until I started in, uh, what, 76, and I um, worked there until 92 when I got caught up in the layoff there, and after I, after they laid me off, I wanted to do something different, so I went into computers, you know, so they retrained me, they paid for my, you know, training. computer training, and I worked for a company called um, Intercom. And then I went to work for um, IEHP, which was a company here in San Bernardino, you know, uh, healthcare. And again, this was the computers and they, yeah, I would yeah, work for information I, systems. Yeah, Inland Empire Health Plan. I worked for them as a computer operator there. Now, were you still uh, over the years still be, being active in athletics? I was. Yes, I. They had what was called what is called the. Um, uh, what is it, Far, um, senior games and what have you. So I continued to jump in as a senior. So you, know, you were in the master's program. You were in the master's program and yes. participating in the seniors. Mm -hmm. So, and I know that uh, when you were at Hughes, is that when you met your wife? I met my wife, Carol, at Hughes Aircraft. Okay, yes. mm -hmm. and got married, and got you married. have four children now? Four kids, yes. And you had nine grandchildren. Nine grandkids, yes. And fortunately, they're all apparently here in the Southern California area. Yes. So things are going along pretty well. Yes. And <clears throat> And uh, life is good. Mm -hmm. And then uh, about 2004, things begin to happen. Yeah, things. Tell us what happened in 2004. Well, in 2004, it was a year that, well, since, like I said, since 68, I haven't taken a break from high jumping. I've just, just been going, going, just going. Just going, going for the last 39, 40 years or whatever, you know, whatever time between, you know, 04. And I decided, okay, I told Carol, my wife, I said, well, you know what, this year, 04, I'm going to rest the whole year. Take a year off. Take a year off and just rest. And it, everything was going good. And so I started in January of 04. Everything was fine. I just took a rest. I come over every back day, and cut back on everything and just, you know, see what's going on at, at the home, you know, and maybe we can do some other things together, she and I. And everything was going fine from January to um, June. Then I start having uh, like problems, you know. I, you know, people say when you take off, you don't do anything. You start gaining weight. Well, I felt myself gaining a little weight, but then I said, okay, maybe I better just go out and run or something, and try to, you know, Not maintain get completely it. Completely yeah. out of shape. Exactly. But, uh... Yeah. But it was more than that, you know. Um, but I didn't really, you know, I'd never been sick or anything, so I didn't know what was going on. I just saw my body changing, you know. I put on a pair of pants. I had some 501 jeans, and I put them on. I couldn't fit them no more. And I said, they shrunk, oh, huh? Yeah. <laughs> it was getting tight in the, you know, legs and what have you. So I didn't, you know, I didn't do. I didn't worry about it. But then it got to the point where I, yeah, I'm an all athlete. My clothes, I'll get back yeah, in shape. I'll get back, and, and I put on the rest of the clothes. Everything was getting too tight. And then my wife was saying. I look like uh, you're gaining weight and your face is a little fatter, uh, you know what I'm saying? Well, she said, you feel okay? I said, yeah. And at that time, when I was swelling up and whatever, I didn't know it was any, I didn't know it was that serious. And so, but something was happening. But something was happening. Yeah, it was more than just gaining weight, you know, the weight that you can burn off. It was right. fluid build, building up, you know. And I had never had any problems with my kidneys, you know, or heart or any of that that I noticed. You've you know? been a strong athlete and everything, you kind of bounce back and yes. have a little rough weekend or a rough week or two, but you're, you're back at it, back in the gym, back working out, and yeah, everything kind of comes back together. But you were kind of going downhill. I there. was going downhill going and downhill. didn't realize it, you know? And didn't realize it. Your wife was making some observations. She was making a lot of it. You didn't yeah. realize it was as bad as it was. And I kept telling her, oh, no, don't worry about it, you know? You just want me to be sick or something, you know? And, but it, it was really happening. You so know. what what was happening? <laughs> well, what I found out, um, one night, I had went, I had, you know, uh, st changed my. I wanted to change my career, so I said I'll go into real estate. So I went to Vegas. I took. I said I want to uh, be a real estate agent. So I went to Vegas. I took the training and all that. And she came up that first that last week that I was in the training. We came back home, and we were went out to eat. And I was really feeling, 
you know, weird, but I didn't, I didn't realize it was that serious. And you know, the thing that really shocked me, though, when it was time to eat, I didn't eat all my food. I only ate a little bit, and I was full. And I kept saying, wow, something, you know. Something, this isn't normal. Yeah, Got a big plate yeah, of food, and I'm plate, hungry. Yeah, yeah, you know, I felt hungry, but I couldn't put it in. You know, it wouldn't stay down. And so I said, okay, we're going to go. We, as a matter of fact, we took a walk after I ate a little bit of food. And everything was fine. We walked about a half a mile or whatever, you know, and back and forth. And we came back, and I laid down. And as soon as I laid down, then I couldn't catch my breath. And you're she running, said, What's You're wrong? running out of breath. Yeah, I'm running out of breath when I laid down to go to bed that night about 9 o'clock. And she said, uh, what's wrong? I said, nothing. I, you know, said nothing at first. And then yeah. I had to jump up because it scared me. Shortness of breath. Shortness of breath. She said, what's wrong? I said, I can't get my breath. So I ran outside to see if that would help. Maybe I needed some air. So I went outside, I leaned on the car, and I was still going, you know, huffing and puffing, and she said, something's wrong, let's go to the emergency. And then, you know, like most men, I'm saying, no, I don't, I know, yeah, I'm, I'm like all right, that. I don't need to go to the hospital. And so we went back in the house, and it happened again after <laughs> I laid down. And I said, oh, okay, let's go, <laughs> you know? So the great thing about it, uh, we was close to Loma Linda. And so um, Carol said, well, we're going to Loma Linda because we couldn't think of any place else. And I said, I don't know if they'll take me. Anyway, I went in there. We went in there. We, but the uh, you, crazy thing about it, I waited 12 hours in emergency, you know, so I'm sitting I mean, there. I was going to say, if you go to the normal <laughs> ER, <laughs> many ERs, people use in the ER like their primary physician. Yeah. Don't go to the ER unless you're critical because yeah. I can say you'll stay in there 12 to 15 hours. Mm -hmm. But you were in there for 12 hours. Finally, they... But, the, yeah, they didn't... Re they Finally, they, I got in, and they didn't realize I was as sick as I was. And, you know, uh, and when I got in there, man, they just started working on me like, you know, they almost knew what was going on, you know, but At I At this point, you still didn't know what I was going still on. didn't know, you know, I'm thinking that, okay, a cold, uh, maybe just flu. flu or something, you know, but the way the young lady, it was, a, it was a lady doctor, I mean, she was incredible, man, I mean, she was working at, she was working at that ER, I mean, you know, that So there's a lot of people working yeah, with you. Yeah, she had people just calling up everything, bring in this, bring in that, and I'm seeing all these machines coming in, and I'm saying, what do I need that for, you know, and she said, and then after this, she hooked me up to all this stuff, and she, you know, she checked me for uh, my prostate and that kind of stuff. And I'm saying, well, you know, I, I didn't, even, you know, I didn't know that much about the prostate and all that. And so she said, this, well, is, all, this is all in the ER. Uh, in the ER, yeah. Okay. Well, and generally they don't check the well, prostate in the ER, well, but she, there's, she there's did, other things going on. Apparently. Yeah. Well, she uh, she knew something was going on, so she checked it, you know, and uh, and then she said, then she came back. She said, well, when did, you know. How long have you had renal failure? And I didn't know what renal failure was. You know, I said, what? How long have I that? had what? And then she said, your kidneys, your kidneys are going out. I said, my kidneys? And I felt fine. You know, I didn't know that my kidney was going out. But then that explained all this fluid buildup. And, and so I wasn't urinating. You put on yeah. a lot of fluid. Yeah, I put a on lot a lot of fluid. fluid. Retention yeah, yeah. In the arms and the legs. And everything and was swelled up. I even my eyes were like, you Really know, kind of puffy. Yeah, puffy and what have you. And uh, but So then, they... they She's telling you, yeah. you're, you're having renal failure. Yeah, and so I'm saying, okay, what is renal failure? And she said, kidneys are going out, bad kidneys or whatever. And I said, oh, man, I just, you know, it just So how do you, how me, do you fix it, huh? Yeah, how do you fix that? <laughs> and so my third day, they, they got me a bed and all that. Well, before they even did that, I guess I was shortening the breath again. They bought this mask to put on me, and I kept pulling it to off. To help you to breathe? To help me breathe. And, I, you know, I guess I was really getting scared, and I kept pulling the thing off. And if somehow they came, and they had to tie it on my face because I kept pulling it off. I said, I don't need that. They said, you do. But anyway, they pulled it off. I mean, they, I let it. My Carol kept saying, Ray, stop, stop, you know. And so I kind of listened to her, and then I started breathing better. And then they put me in the bed, and they said, uh, get him up to somewhere. And, you know, I was in there for, like, 17 days, right? 17 days. Yeah, seven days. You go in, not sure what's wrong, <laughs> right. and you're st in there for 17 days. Yeah. So they're doing all kinds of testing and performing all kinds of things on you. So what's going through your mind at this point? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. because Why are they I keeping didn't, me Yeah, up? because I didn't have any, I didn't have, I wasn't hurting. I didn't have any pain. No pain. No pain so I figured I was okay. And you know, usually a person is sick. Oh yeah. You got pain or they say this hurt, that hurt. And they kept asking me, did this hurt? I, no, it don't hurt. Nothing was hurting. And so I felt I was okay and they was overreacting, you know, but I said, well, make too much out of this thing. Yeah. 
And so I said, well, okay, I'll just lay here and see what happened. My third day in the uh, ICU, then they said, we're going to put you on dialysis. I said, dialysis? What's that? And then again, this big machine come, you know, rolling in here, and I'm looking at this big machine like, oh, man, what are they going to do with all of, you know, all these gadgets on it? And we're going to hook you up to it. <laughs> so they bring in a big machine for yeah. dialysis. And for our listening audience, yeah. dialysis is for somebody that's in renal failure. And re Their kidneys are not functioning properly. Correct. And so the dialysis is to help with that. Yeah. And is this a matter that they hook you up for 10 minutes? No, it was a matter of when they hook you up for three hours. You for know. three hours? Yeah, for three hours a day. No, that was at four hours. It was, it was a three long time, you know, three day. or four hours. While you're in the hospital. While I'm in the hospital. And I, um, I'm sitting there, I'm laying there, and finally the guy came. He, you know, put some holes in my, I, they did it through the groin, you know, at that time. And so I lay there, and I watched this blood going through this machine is filtering it and what have you. Okay, the, and I said, well, maybe I do need it. My blood looked like it was dirty, you know, because I know blood was supposed to be red or whatever, and so it didn't look, you know, like Didn't bright. look like it should, you thought. And so I said, okay, maybe uh, this is my oil change. It changed, right. you know. So I'm watching it go through and making all this noise, and so I'm learning this, you know. And every three, so I said, well, how long is this going to be? You know, and they said, we, you're going to do this three days a week. I said, three days a week? And then I started thinking, well, how am I going to practice? You know, how am I going yeah, to get you know, up? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to get out of the hospital, and I got some <laughs> yeah. games to play and yes. some jumping to do. Places and, to go, you know. Yeah, three days a week for how many weeks? For, yeah, and I'm thinking, yeah, you, you know, it goes for a, a, a number of days or whatever, a month Couple or whatever, and, and I'm off. Yeah. All right. Well, after I got better, after my 17 days in there, they let me go home. Then I, they said, okay, now we're going to set you up to go to the dialysis cylinder across the street. I said, Dallas, okay, okay, all right. So I went across the street, and they said, okay, every day, no, every every other day. So it was at that time, it was Tuesday, went, Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. Yeah. But not just for one week. Yeah, not for one week. I was in there from 04 to 06, you know. And so you're going in there three times a three week. Now, I, I have learned that people that are on dialysis, you know, you're either going in for the dialysis that day, or you're recovering from the dialysis and resting up and going back for the dialysis right after that. I mean, yeah. it's it is a it's the totality of your it's survival existence. That's what it is. Every day, every other day, you're either getting ready for it or you're recovering for it. And that's what I kept seeing every day. I kept saying, you know, going back and forth, and I kept saying, all I'm doing is eating, drinking, and then they come and take this and stuff dialysis. off. Dialysis. And then I said, wow. So I had to really make an adjustment like that, you know. And plus, I was already weak. I was so weak. Dialysis. If you've never been on dialysis, man, that, bad. I mean, it's bad. It's bad. But you gotta be. You gotta believe that you're gonna, you know, get past it or, you know, get used to it or something, you know, because um, the, those days that I sat in there and dialysis, and I'm watching, it's like 20 people in there, and everybody, you know, got all kind of different things wrong, right? And I kept saying, well. I don't have everything that these other people have, but... So I'm not the same. Yeah, it's not the same. And I kept saying, well, you know, okay, I'll be off. So I remember after I got a little bit better, you know, to the point where I can, uh, you know, I was catching my breath. I didn't, I wasn't running, you know, getting, um, losing my wind or whatever. I, I asked the doctors when they, they came to visit. They do a checkup every year, I mean, every month. I said, well, and they kept saying, your labs are looking good, blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, when, when, when can I get off? And the doctor, he looked at me, he said, uh, the only way you're going to get off is with a transplant. And I said, a transplant? He, I said, a kidney transplant? He said, yeah. Again, I'm saying, my kidneys... They don't feel they bad. Don't, they don't feel bad. I said, my kidneys, they probably were just tired from me, you know, doing all that excursion, you know, running and jumping all really over them. What saying is, you don't get off of this. <laughs> yeah, you don't get off this of it. This is a lifetime this thing, is a lifetime. or you're going to have a kidney transplant. Right. Now, we missed one important thing mm -hmm. uh, as we're talking. When you're in the hospital... There's something else that happened with your hospital, something that having to do with your heart. Oh, the heart, yeah. I, when I was in there, the, I think it was like the second week, I'm laying in the bed and I'm talking. My wife was there, Carol was talking, and the nurse was talking. He was coming back and forth, you know, and, um, you know, they had the monitor going, the monitor was you know, like it's supposed to. And just as he came in and he was talking to me, then something went, like <laughs> that, and the guy, and so I, I heard it and saw it, my wife saw it, and he said, oh, you just had a heart attack. I said, a heart attack? I said, I didn't feel anything. He said, well, the machine is showing it right here. 
And then there was another problem. So here I am laying in there on dialysis. Now I had a heart attack, you know. And they also, it was sometime during this time frame, <laughs> they discovered that you had prostate cancer. Yeah, and then, and then the, the second week, the, right after the heart attack, then the guy came in and said, okay, we got your, your, your know, last for, the, for your prostate. You got prostate cancer, we're going to have to remove your prostate. And I'm laying there like, oh, man. Three things, you know, and I know, you know, most people don't even survive one right, or two things. Got I got three things, man. And I'm so you had heart, you yeah. got cancer, and you're on dialysis. Your kidneys are in failure. So in failure. you're watching these patients as you go in, and and you're seeing that they're they're not getting any better. They're not getting any better. And yeah. you're not like they are. You're yeah. going to get better. And your doctor says, hey, the only thing you're going to do is you're going to have to have a, a transplant. That's the only solution. Right. But you determine. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. I kept telling the doctor, I said, well, I said, well, I, I even told him that day. I didn't know nothing about dialysis. I thought he was just kidding me because sure. he was smiling, you know. He said, no, you, you need a transplant. Your kidneys are, are gone, you know. It was to the point where I couldn't urinate or anything. So, okay, I, I understand that. But, you know, suppose, you know, I start, you know, urinating again, and he, he didn't want to hear it. You know, it's like, okay, yeah. You're just one thankful. of those patients. You'll, you'll finally figure out with it. So I told him, I said, well, doctor, I said, well, I'll, I'll probably be the first one to get off without a transplant. And he, he laughed again. You know, he, I mean, sure. the guys here Couldn't at Loma Linda was, I mean, they were, they were great. But so what did you a do? Sense, sense of humor. What I did was I, I looked around. Each day that I came in there, I watched everybody. I kept saying, well, something they're not doing right. You know, you we come in, we weigh ourselves. They take us, they t you know, take the same thing stuff time off after time. time after time. And I said, okay, what I'm going to start doing, I'm going to start walking. And that was the first thing they said. No, we don't want you to walk. And then I kept saying, well, okay, whenever something's wrong, I, I, I had to bring in my athletic, you know, training. Begin focusing. Yeah, focusing. I kept saying, well, okay, I never, I didn't know how to high jump until I got a coach and I started doing, you know, doing the things right. You know, what they taught me, I kept practicing. Even though I kept knocking that bar down, I kept saying, well, okay, I'm going to jump until I don't knock that bar down and do everything correctly. And I said, well, this I have to do the same thing in dialysis. I have to be able to get up without falling. Because on dialysis, you, I mean, it's, so, it's, it's really something dead. that really So you begin, our time is running by here, yeah. but you begin walking at home. Yes. What did you do? Uh, I, my goal was to walk three miles, but I, what I did, I couldn't walk from, you know, three or four feet, six at feet home. at home. So what I did, I said, okay, if I walked that, that little, that little uh, space, I, I kept falling. I said, well, maybe I better get a chair. So I got a chair, and when I got to that spot, I'll sit down, and then I'll catch my breath again, then I'll try to go further. So I had to keep, you know, keep telling myself to train and walk further and whatever, but I had this chair with me. So little by little you started. So over a period of a year, it took you a year where you're getting out and you're walking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then you had you had surgery for your prostate. You had the surgery for the okay, prostate. Okay. And you told me something very interesting there because sometimes people that have had prostate and surgery they do have some complications. They do. What What's the difference? Because you're saying you talked to one of your friends. Yeah, I talked to one of my well, Dr. Baldwin. <laughs> Here at Loma Linda. A urologist. A urologist. I mean, the greatest guy, man. I mean, I mean, just, he, he, he laid it all down. He, he called me in his office, and that's what, that was the scariest thing. When he went, he went, went through office, all the different went things. Went through all these different things, and he kept telling me the ups and the downs and all this. What do you want to do? And I said, I, you know, I was putting my faith in him because I really, I really got a connection with sure. him. Sure. And he said, if you follow my directions, do what I tell you to do, you shouldn't have a problem. Okay, that's a critical point that we want our audience to listen to because uh, what you discovered, the difference between you and one of your friends is you followed the counsel and the instructions in terms of the follow-up and it alleviated many of the problems and some of the side effects that other men have. Now, our, we're coming down to the end of our time here. You overcame. You're no longer on dialysis. No longer Because of your dialysis. persistence. Yeah. You've, you're on top of your heart problem now. Right. And you're still actively involved. You're building up your strength. Yes. And you're helping. I understand you're helping other Olympians. You told yes. me that you went over and were, were counseling somebody that was in the hospital recently. Yes. So you're actively involved. Yes. What, what's the future hold for you? Uh, the future holds for me is just, like I said, following, following the directions of whoever gives it to you. You know, okay. like I say, when Dr. Baldwin asked me to do this, do that, I did it. And everything that he told me to do, it worked. 
And after my six week checkup, I went to see him. I, everything was fine. He was, he was really impressed. He kept saying, well, you don't have to use the pads anymore or whatever. You know, I said, no, I'm finished with it. He said, oh man, well, that's, that's great. And just by him saying that made me really feel good. And I said, well, okay, well, what I'm going to do is when I have friends, I had had some friends, like I said, they had to, went through the same surgeries, but they had the complications. And I had to go back to those guys and say, look, did the doc, Did you do what the doctor asked you to do? Follow the direction. Follow the, the direction. They said no. They just had their surgeries and started doing whatever they was going to do. And Well, you know, we're, we're coming down to the end of our time, Ray, and I know that God is going to continue using you. I know that this weekend you're going up to San Francisco and participating in an event there, and then you're going mm -hmm. to be going on up to the to the Winter Games. Yes. And you're actively involved, yes. and you're, a, you're an inspiration to those that have known you and have watched you. And even though you've been actively involved as an athlete, you know, these different things came along, but they haven't stopped you. No. God's got a plan for your life. And you've been putting your trust in Him, and you've been listening to the doctors and following their counsel. And for those that are looking on, you're, there are other people out there in the audience right now, just like you, Ray, that they've encountered one or two things that... Uh, they don't, it doesn't need to stop them. They can pers persevere and pursue and listen to God's voice and pay careful attention to the instructions that the doctor has for them. For those of you that are looking on, you know, it's been a joy to get acquainted here with Ray and to hear his story and to know that God's going to continue to open and close doors for him. And for those of you that are looking on, God has a plan for your life. Give him a chance. Put your trust in him. I'm Lynn Martell for... Uh, journey of hope and we thank you for tuning in for your support for your prayers until next week we want to wish you God's blessings God bless you each one Boy, that went cool. you.